Good morning. Welcome to Maysville this morning. If you want to open up song number 236, that'll be our opening song. Number 236. I was told uh, the cradle roll had perfect attendance this morning, so congratulations on all the babies. And uh, glad to have that. Also, uh, service team two will meet in the back this morning after our conclusion uh, to round up a crew to go see uh, Sister Merrill Renfro. And if you have any uh, interest in being a part of that group, you'll meet back in the back where Service Team 2 meets. And uh, that's not just um, for Service Team 2. Anybody who has interest in doing that, uh, you can see Brother Fairchild in the back with Service Team 2. We've got uh, several on our sick and um, recovery list and uh, surgeries and tests going on. And I hope you grabbed a bulletin on your way in and those individuals are listed there. Uh, I did learn that Brother David Ogle, uh, son of Lynn Quillen, uh, had open heart surgery on Friday. He is um, recovering right now. Um, is he in ICU still or out of ICU? He's out. Out of ICU. He is still recovering, so please keep uh, David Ogle in your prayers at this time. Also, uh, Dean Crutchfield uh, had some tests done. He is back at home now, and we'll try to have his address posted soon, uh, but he is back at home. We mentioned uh, the past couple of weeks uh, there will be a bridal tea for uh, Jessica Deaton and Vince Andrews next Sunday. This will be from uh, 2 to 4 in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, Jessica and Vince are scheduled to be married May the 11th, and they are registered at Bed Bath & Beyond and Target. Also, a note for the ladies in the bulletin, all ladies of the congregation are invited to uh, the home of Sue Wirtz Thursday, April the 26th at 10 a.m., uh, the monthly, uh, monthly meeting. Uh, for Ladies Helping Hands. The service project this month is Restore Care 5 at the home of uh, Pam Jones. Uh, there is a list in the, on the table in the foyer for the, uh, the items that are needed and if you have any interest in being a part of that please pick up the list out there in the foyer and um, you can see Sue Wirtz for any questions on that. There's also several notes in the bulletin as well about the upcoming gospel meetings and uh, um, uh, occasions coming up here. I know we've got our gospel meeting coming up from May the 6th to the 9th. Uh, Brother Jim Dearman will be our speaker. And uh, there's several notes to be made in the bulletin, so please grab one of those if you haven't. And uh, several things going on around us that we can uh, be a part of. Also, our, uh, our Honduras contributions have, have come to a little bit of a, a halt. And uh, we are still gladly accepting any contributions for our housing projects. Uh, if you'd like to contribute to the housing needs, uh, please see me or Beth or uh, Butch or Patty Weaver, and we'll gladly accept any donations. Also, if you have any questions on what items we may need as far as uh, medical supplies or clothing uh, for the people there that we'll take with us, uh, please let us know. We'll try to answer those questions for you. I believe that's all the announcements I have this morning. Again, opening song number 236. We'll have our closing prayer by Brother Vernon Perriman. And uh, right now, let's join together. Mike Broad will have our opening prayers. We'll begin. Will you bow with me? Our God and our Father, we are so thankful that we have this opportunity to come into this building today. Father, especially that we were able to get out of our homes and head toward this direction in such a beautiful climate. We hope, Father, that once we come into this building that we can study those things which have been presented to us in Bible class, these things that we're about to learn in worship. And Father, we hope that through song that we can sing these songs and understand the words so that all aspects of this worship will be accept acceptable unto you. And the things that we do and when we go out in the community, that those that we come in contact with can see you and us. We hope, Father, that we can continue to study the Bible that's there for us each and every day. We hope, Father, that we can read those words and apply them to our lives. Father, we are so thankful for the men who serve us as elders, Brother Jim, Emmett, Mac, and Carrie, and their families. We ask, Father, that you be with them 
as they labor here with us and they serve us in this capacity, that when they do make decisions that we can back them 100%. And at times, Father, just tell them how much we appreciate them and that we do care for them and we do love them. We're thankful for our two ministers, Brother Tim and Brother Lonnie and their families, for the time that they've been here with us, for the many years of service and the years of service to come. We ask, Father, that they will continue to study the Word and that they can present it to us in such an easy fashion where we can learn more about you. We're thankful for our Bible teachers, for those that take time out of their busy lives to study the Word and go into the classroom and study with the students. And we're mindful of every member here at this congregation, and we ask that you be with us as we strive to be unified as we Try to study thy word. Father, at this moment we are mindful of those who have been mentioned, those who are sick, especially those of our number. Father, we ask that you continue to be with Brother Totsi after he's gone through his recent surgery. We ask, Father, that you will be with him as he recuperates. And he gets stronger and get back up on his feet once again. And hopefully we can start visiting him once more. Father, we ask that you be with David Ogle. In a time that he has had heart surgery. I understand, Father, he's got a few complications today. We ask that you be with him and the family and especially the doctors that monitor his progress. And so that he can be back through his normal walks of life. We understand that Merle Renfro is having some complications. We ask that you be with her. And we're thankful, Father, that Brother Dean Crutchfield has regained some of his strength and is now at home. And Father, if there are others, we ask that you be with them. We're especially mindful, Father, of those that are of our number that are unable to be here, that are sick, those that are elderly, we ask that you continue to be with them. And Father, those that are elderly, those that do find a way to get here through wheelchair, through canes, through help, Father, they're always an inspiration to each and every one of us. Father, we're so thankful at this congregation for our young people, for their desire to learn more about you and those who work with them. We ask that you will be with them each and every day because we do realize that there are those out there that's trying to pull them into the world of sin. And we ask that we can study with them, talk to them whenever is necessary. Father, we also realize that there are men and women that serve us in different capacities, whether it be the fire department, rescue squad, policemen, or those in the military. Father, we ask that you be with them as they serve and protect us so that we can have a peace of mind, so that we can be secure. And we hope, Father, that these nations that we do assist, that some good will come out of this, and this world will be peaceful one day. Father, in the next couple of weeks, there's a lot of gospel meetings going on. We ask that you be with each and every one of them, and especially ours, in the first week of May. We ask that you be with Brother Dearman, as he readies himself to present lessons that can touch our hearts or uplift us and motivate us and keep us going in that one direction. We hope, Father, that we can do our part in trying to be here, trying to make phone calls and make visits and encourage someone to be here.
Father, once again, we are so thankful for the country that we live in. We hope, Father, that we continue to assemble in buildings like this without fear. And, Father, we're thankful for each and every one that has come here today. May we all be uplifted. And these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. I found my Lord and He is mine. He won me by His love. I'll serve Him all my years of time and dwell with Him above. His yoke is easy, His burden is light. I found His soul, I found His soul, His servant. Twenty-seven, four hundred twenty-seven. We'll do the first and the uh, last stanza of this. <clears throat> Must Jesus bear the cross? about the cross that we bear we remember the cross that Jesus bore as he went to Calvary for us and suffered there and became our resurrected Savior we celebrate the supper here in just a moment we'll sing the <clears throat> second and third stanzas <clears throat> the blessed son of God Oh. 
Bow with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time we have to come and gather around your table. We thank you most for your son coming, living upon this earth, and giving us a perfect example. And we thank you for him mostly for dying upon the cross so that we may have a home in heaven with thee. We thank you for this bread that represents his body as it was beaten and scorned and hung up on that cross. And we ask that you bless each one that partakes it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. In like manner, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this cup, the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that was shed upon the cross for us. Help us, Father, as we look back to that sacrifice to realize that no one took his life, but he freely gave his life in our place. And he gave up his life blood. We know, Father, that this great act of love upon your part and upon his part was done for us. And help us to look back on that sacrifice as we partake of this cup and examine our own lives and take of this in a way that you would have us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
number 19, number 19, based on New Testament practice, and we today continue to uh, collect an offering, a free will offering to promote the work of the church in our, our area as well as parts of the country, parts of the country and even the world. Uh, but, you know, um, we, we do owe honor to God. In ancient times, they used to, if you went in to visit the king, you always took some gift uh, with you and paid homage to him. And as this song points out, we owe our allegiance and our offerings to God the king, who is all-powerful. And we acknowledge him as we, as we give back to him this morning. Sing the first and the last stanzas, please. <clears throat> All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring Heavenly Father, we come to you now to thank you for the opportunity that we have to work with our minds and with our hands. May we take this opportunity to give back what is rightfully thine and do so as cheerily as we partake. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Please mark number 23, number 23, and we'll sing that to encourage after our lesson this morning. And now number 312, number 312. We'll do the first and the last stanza of this. If you'd like to, please stand and we'll sing it together. <clears throat> they tried my Lord and Master with no one to defend within the halls of Pilate. He stood with Hallelujah. 
creation is why I am his friend. I'll be a friend to Jesus, my life for him I'll spend. I'll be a friend to Jesus until my Good morning. It is very good for me to be able to look out on the audience and be able to look upon your faces. It has been a couple of weeks since uh, I have had this privilege, and I am very thankful that uh, you are here, that I am here, and that we have the opportunity to look upon one another. It seems like sometimes that... uh, Time goes by very quickly. Other times it goes by slowly. Uh, But when you're out of pocket for a couple of weeks, like we have been for the last couple, it seems like it's been a long time since I've been with you. So it's good to be back and uh, glad to have the opportunity to see each of you. The history of mankind shows an interesting quality. Sometimes as we try to prove our existence or to make a mark so that we'll be remembered, we do things. In Genesis chapter 11, we have this statement, verse 4, And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. You recognize that, of course, as the, the words of those that were building what we refer to as the Tower of Babel. God scrambled their languages. They were interested in making a name for themselves. A number of years later, down in the land of Egypt, there would be many men, kings, who would build monuments to themselves, which in and of itself is rather an interesting thought. Long before they died, they began building pyramids in which their bodies would be buried. And they wanted to be remembered for always. And we have those, those remnants, those impossible to imagine structures. If you've been to Egypt, Seeing pictures is sometimes not capable of really bringing the scale of these objects. But when you go and stand by one of the pyramids and you see the size of those individual blocks and then you see how many of them are laid across in a line and you know that that extends also backwards deep and then across the back and then building up from there in that pyramid shape that classic triangle, huge structures, just to say, I was here, and I was capable of doing this, and I want you to remember. Herod the Great was one of those kinds of builders who wanted very much to make his mark on the world, He grew up perhaps with a little bit of a chip on his shoulder. His father had worked very hard to get him in the position that he was, worked the political ropes with Rome so that Herod would be proclaimed the the absolute ruler of uh, the land of Palestine. And so for many years he served in this capacity. But Herod was a hard man. He was a man who wanted power. He was a man who was afraid of losing power. He was a man who wanted to honor himself, and so he built monuments all over the countryside. Some of them are gone now. Some still remain. One of the interesting monuments he built was right on the the rocks on the seashore. He built a palace outside of the city of Caesarea 
on the Mediterranean Sea where the water would come up and kiss right against that palace. Of course, it's all gone. The storms many, many, many years ago that rage on the Mediterranean Sea completely obliterated all traces of Herod's palace on the sea with the exception of the, of the grooves and the stones where the foundation rocks themselves were laid into that bedrock. There are some other demonstrations of Herod's power that are a little easier to find. We can see them because they still remain. Two of the most dramatic, one is on the what we refer to as the Mountain of Masada, which is a little raised plateau just off the Dead Sea. And here Herod built a palace and a stronghold. And the palace at Masada, you can still go and visit. And many of the remains are still there. The big cisterns that he carved out to hold the water, the granaries that he built, the palaces that, that are stair-stepped off that northern face, facing out over the Judean desert and the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, Sea of Galilee far to the north, Dead Sea right there. It's an impressive sight. Herod built those things. Yet he died. The second very observable creation of Herod is the, the Temple Mount. If you've seen the Dome of the Rock, the Islamic holy place that is now built on the site where the temple of Solomon once stood. And you understand that all of that platform there that all of those buildings are on, the modern buildings, all of that platform was built by Herod the Great. And he extended the boundaries all the way around. And when you come up to the walls now and you see what's left of those walls, Herod did that. Herod built those over a period of many years. They were there in the time of Jesus, still being constructed. The only thing that's really left of it that the Jews participate in is what's described as the Western Wailing Wall part of the original Temple Mount where the Jews today go and deliver their prayers and put little pieces of paper with writings on them in the cracks of those rocks in an attempt to get close to where the temple was at one point in time. But much closer to today, we have a, a monument of the building of men. There's a great ship built just a little over a hundred years ago today. And unless you have been completely cut off from television or radio or various media sources, you know that today is the 100th anniversary of the sinking of Titanic. In fact, a hundred years ago, right this minute, Titanic was on its, its final few hours before it struck an iceberg. They were having their last meal together. In just a few hours, the last rays of sunshine would be falling onto the deck of that ship before it went into that night and saw that last sunset and the events that would unfold after it. It was huge. It's hard to really get an image of, of the Titanic in our minds. I, I gave you some information on the front cover of the bulletin with some comparisons of size and, and, and things, but it's still hard to imagine. Three football fields long, just, just a little short of, was how long that is. And you stand to look down a football field and imagine three of them put together, one after another, and that's how long the Titanic was. With 20-something decks from top to bottom, 191 feet from keel to its top mast enormous ship and it had all of the luxuries that man could put into it those who created it wanted it to be the equal of any land-based five-star hotel they wanted if you were in first class passage you wanted for nothing it was luxurious in the extreme 
There were million dollar paintings hanging the walls. There was exotic woodwork everywhere. The grand staircase, one of the most beautiful and symbolic pieces in Titanic, extended some six stories or six floors through the boat with domed ceilings. It was opulent. It was magnificent. It was the greatest ship that had ever been built up until that time. When Titanic sailed, it was the largest moving object that had ever been made in the world. It was the largest ship. And yet, there was darkness that loomed ahead, and in that darkness, disaster. The ship itself was, and there's some discussion about this, was said to be unsinkable. After, of course, the events, some of the people who were involved with White Star Lines said that they never claimed the ship was unsinkable, that that myth developed afterwards, but that's not the case. Just a little research shows that the brochures that uh, were distributed concerning the White Star Lines of uh, Titanic and its sister ship said it was designed to be unsinkable. When the president of the White Star Line late in the evening was called concerning Titanic and asked whether or not the rumors of it being in trouble were correct, his response was, and I quote, We place absolute confidence in Titanic. We believe the boat is unsinkable. That was Vice President, Mr. P.A. Franklin. And at the time he uttered those words, Titanic was already on the bottom of the Atlantic, almost 12,500 feet under the ocean, two and a half miles down, laying at the bottom of the sea. Point number one is, those are some of the statements of the hubris of man building a tower that reaches into heavens, building pyramids that would be eternal, building buildings so that you would always be remembered, and then this great ship, unsinkable. But at number two, let's talk about those who depended on God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7 is where we're going to spend a moment. And I want to read this text to you. Your version may be slightly different. By faith, Noah, having been warned by God of things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith. Where does faith come from? Paul said in Romans chapter 10 verse 17, faith comes by hearing the word of God. Not just having it. It's believing it. It's relying on it. There have been many people through the years who have heard the Word of God, but did not believe it. They did not have faith. All of the children of Israel who stood at the base of Mount Sinai when God descended upon it and thundered and roared upon that mountain as He first came to uh, the children of Israel after they had been released from the bondage of Egypt. They heard, they saw, and when God spoke from heaven, they were so frightened that they called upon Moses and they say, please don't let this God speak to us anymore. You go up and talk to him and we'll do whatever you say. And Moses did go up on the mountain and spend 40 days with God. 
But when the people heard the message of God, they were not always willing to follow it. They didn't always believe it. It wasn't by faith. And so Paul would write later and describe this group, both to the Corinthians and to the Romans, and say this group did not have the faith they needed. The author of the book of Hebrews would look back to them and say theirs was not mixed with faith, therefore they became disobedient. But Noah, Noah depended on God. Noah didn't design the ark. God designed the ark. It wasn't his plan to cleanse the world, to save those souls. That was God's plan. It was God's work. Noah just obeyed. But when we say those words, he, he just obeyed, we make that sound as if that is something insignificant. And it wasn't insignificant. It was, it was monumental. The statements made concerning Noah is that God told Noah about something that had never existed before and that Noah could not possibly imagine taking place. That there is going to be a flood upon the earth that is going to destroy all of the things that are on the earth except what is in the boat that you're going to construct. Now, who would believe that? Would you? If God had spoken to you instead of Noah and said, we want, I want you to build this boat, and the size of the boat that Noah built. Just look at the statistics that I've compared on the other side. 450 feet long. Still a football, and a football field and a half. Built out of wood. With their own hands. That they had to go out and find, and then cut, and then shape, and then place, and then construct this enormous craft. So when we say that Noah just obeyed by faith, those are incredible words. Obedience is doing sometimes what seems foolish because you're told to would you go with me and look at a couple of passages that have this concept in them? Let's start in Luke chapter 5. Luke 5, let's start reading in verse 3. Then he got into one of the boats, this is Jesus, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word I will let down the net. Now it's clear what's taking place here, here uh, taking place here, and this is a perfect illustration of true obedience. True obedience is not doing something that you think is a good idea. That's not obedience. True obedience is not doing something that you enjoy doing. True obedience is demonstrated most clearly when it is not something that you enjoy doing, but you would do anyway. When it is not something you think is a good idea, but you would do so anyway, when you are complying with the request of another. And here is Simon in his boat. And he's worked all night, and he's preparing to put his boat away for the, for, the, uh, for the day and go get some rest, perhaps to work again later. But Jesus is there, and he takes control of his boat and, and moves him out into the water, and there preaches to the crowd. And Simon allows this to take place. But now the Lord is through speaking, and so Simon's finally going to get his rest. And instead, the Lord says, now let's go do a little fishing. Go out here and put your nets down. Now, Simon's already been fishing all night. He knows how to fish. He makes his living fishing. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus is a carpenter. He's a nice guy. 
But what does he know about fishing? Nonetheless, and Peter has this open conversation with himself and with the Lord. Lord, we've, we've fished all night. There's nothing here. Okay, but you tell me to go out and fish again. I'll do it. If I was going to describe a pattern for appropriate obedience on the part of children toward their parents, I might look to Luke chapter 5 as a good example. Because children may often find themselves, as teenagers especially, in a place where their own ideas are, are coming along and when they are very intelligent, having all of the intelligence that they will in, uh, in adult life, not all the experience yet, and still under the, the oversight of their parents, and they might find themselves from time to time being asked or being required by their parents to do things that they find foolish or restrictive or in some other way not meeting what they think is appropriate for them and their, their age and their maturity. And yet as a parent instructs them there, what a better sign of obedience than to say, Mom, Dad, I don't know that this is a good idea. I think I have more responsibility than that, or I'm, I'm more capable than this. Nevertheless, because you have told me to, I will comply. It's obedience. Let's look at another. Old Testament, book of Exodus, chapter 17. Let's start with the first verse. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin. Actually, that should be pronounced seen. According to the commandment of the Lord, encamped in Rephidim, there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Chapter 17, verse 4. So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. How would you like to be Moses here? The people are thirsting to death. They're, they're in rebellion. They're wanting Moses' head. They said, here, you're the guy who led us out here, and you led us out here, and now we're, we're all going to die of thirst, and all of our animals are going to die. And so Moses turns to the Lord and said, Lord, they're about to rebel against me. What am I supposed to do about this? And God says, tell you what, go out there in front of them and take a stick. And I want you to hit a rock and water's going to come out and, and uh, going to give everybody enough to drink. Huh? <laughs> do what? You want me to do what? You want me to take a stick and go stand in front of a rock and hit the rock and it's going to spout out water? Now, you see, we know the story. We know how the story ends. We know the water pours forth. So we don't even find it incredible at all. We just take it for granted. Yeah, Moses hit the rock and the water came out. Put yourself in Moses' shoes. What's plan B? Wouldn't you want to know that? Hey, Lord, what if the water doesn't come out? What if there's not enough? What do I do then? There's no plan B. The rest of that verse says, and Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. That's obedience. That's faith. One more. Back to the book of Hebrews again. Chapter 11, verse 8. 
We just read verse 7. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. God had called Abraham to go out. Abraham, come and follow me. Abraham went. He led him to a land where he promised him he is going to have this as an inheritance. Your children will own all of this land everywhere you set your foot. And yet while Abraham walked upon this land, you know how he's living? He's living in a tent. He doesn't own any of it. And yet he stayed there. Why? Why did Abraham stay in that land when although God had promised it to his, his, all of his inheritance... His children who would come. Abraham got nothing. But he believed that God would keep the promise that he kept. That's those who depend on God. And then, number three, let's make some comparisons if we can for just a few minutes. The Titanic depended upon man. It was man's materials, man's design, man's purpose. The ark depended upon God. Noah didn't create the things that the ark was made out of. God did. Trees, wood, tar from the ground. And God said, here's how you're going to build this ark. God made the design. Noah didn't come up with the design. God came up with the design. Noah didn't come up with the purpose. God came up with the purpose. And that purpose was to save humanity. God was going to bring it about a destruction. A second contrast we could make. Titanic ignored real and present dangers. Striking an iceberg is what sank Titanic. But there were a lot of things that led up to it prior to that time. The lookouts who were posted to watch out for icebergs didn't have binoculars. They were just standing looking with their own eyes. It was an extremely calm night. There was no waves. If there had been some waves, if there had been some sort of motion, it is suggested that perhaps those lookouts could have seen the, the waves lapping up on the icebergs sooner than they did, but they did not. It was a moonless clear, still night. But they had had warnings. Other ships had passed through the area and they knew there were, ice, there were icebergs, there were pieces that were floating in the area. Captain Smith did not slow down the boat, although he did make a course correction and went farther to the south where he believed he would be going around the ice, but he was mistaken. The day before, they were supposed to have run a lifeboat drill that might have saved many lives. But the captain believed that it was un unrequired, unnecessary, a waste of time. Because after all, Titanic was unsinkable. There was hardly enough lifeboats available for half of the people who were on the ship. And many of the people who were involved in the designing of the ship believed that those lifeboats were a waste. Because the ship was unsinkable, after all. But they were wrong. In contrast to that, we have Noah, warned of God, moved with fear, and prepared an ark. We're guilty of this, aren't we? Of not taking warnings seriously? Jesus told Simon in Luke chapter 22, verse 31... Simon, Satan has asked for you that he might sift you like wheat. The devil is a real force, a real force of evil. But sometimes we're not very concerned about the devil. Peter was. He remembered the experiences of his life. He remembered the trial in the garden where he failed so miserably. Perhaps he remembered 
when his faith failed him as he stepped out from the boat to walk on the Sea of Galilee to the Lord. And so Peter would write later, Be sober, be watchful, for your enemy or adversary, the devil, is walking about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Peter knew that the devil and the force of the devil was a real, real concern, a threat to life. And he passed that on to us. Or, how about eternity? Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. One of the most powerful warnings that will come to us will come through the death of our own loved ones. Those who are our family. And there is a reminder in the closeness of that that we too will go that way. That we will join them. I'd like to read the words of one of our songs. Someday you'll stand at the bar on high. Someday your record you'll see. Someday, you'll answer the question of life. What will your answer be? Sadly, you'll stand if you're unprepared. Trembling, you'll fall on your knee, facing the sentence of life or of death. What will that sentence be? Now is the time to prepare, my friend. Make your soul spotless and free, washed in the blood of the crucified one. He Will your answer be? You see, we've been warned. We've been warned in our life by God, just as Noah was. Be prepared for this time. And how will we prepare? Just, just one more thought as we close. Noah was a proclaimer of righteousness, according to Peter. And there are several statements that are made concerning that, that righteousness that God wanted us to understand. You remember the statement made in John chapter 3, verse 16? That God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish. That's an interesting word, perish. It's the same word that Peter uses in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. God is not slack concerning His promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what God wants for us. Not that we should perish, but that we should repent. And then finally from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The message to Noah was foolishness to those who would be lost. To Noah, it was salvation. Just, just the ark. And the church is so much like the ark. It is God's ark today, we might describe it. It's not a perfect parallel, but it's, it's very close. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, Paul says, We have been transferred or converted out of the kingdom of darkness into the, the kingdom of the Son of His love, where we have forgiveness of sins, where we are made righteous through the blood of His Son. In Acts chapter 2, verse 47, we're told that the Lord adds to the church those who were saved. And how is it that they, they became saved? Noah walked up those steps or the, that ramp up into the ark, and God closed that door, and there he found safety, security. And our steps lead us into the paths of righteousness. When we hear the message of God proclaimed, and we believe it to be true, John chapter 8, verse 24, And then we change our lives in repentance 
We give up those things that are immoral. Luke chapter 13, verse 3 and 5, we repent. And then as Jesus described in Matthew chapter 10, those who make that confession with their mouth, Jesus will confess them before the Father who is in heaven. And those who will not confess, Jesus will not confess before the Father who is in heaven. And we make that confession. With the mouth, confession is made into salvation, Paul described in Romans chapter 10. And then that final step where we are buried with Christ in baptism. Colossians chapter 2 verse 12. That's what they were told in Acts chapter 2, 38. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Galatians chapter 3, 27. We are buried, baptized into Christ. And Paul described in Romans chapter 6, raised to walk a new life. So here we have these two, two crafts. The greatest work of mankind that sank and cost the lives of many. The ark of God that accomplished exactly the work that God intended for it. And we are called today by the power of God to believe the testimony of the warnings of what lays ahead and the salvation that God has for us in the church, in His kingdom. And the question then is, what will we do about it? When First Peter, or when Peter wrote in First Peter chapter three verse twenty-one, and talked about Noah, he said the like figure is baptism, which also now saves us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the appeal to God for a clean conscience. That's our comparison of an ark. The place where God takes care of us. And I've got a question for you as we conclude. Have you been obedient to the voice by faith? Have you heard the message that God has proclaimed about how, how all of us must work out our own salvation? Those who receive the message of Peter... In Acts chapter 2, verse 40, as many of them heard and received and were baptized, verse 47, were added to the Lord's kingdom, His church. Are you a part of that kingdom today? And if you're not, then will you take the steps that are required in order to become a part of the kingdom of God? Everything stands in readiness now. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and you would make that confession before this audience, you would take that step into the waters of baptism to be buried with your Lord in baptism and raised to walk a new life. Even today, you can enter into that place that God has prepared. If you need to do that, or if you need to return home, the invitation is for you. We invite you to come as we stand and sing.
closing song will be 598, 598. We'll do the first and third stanzas of this and uh, dismiss in prayer in a moment. We hope you'll be back tonight at 5 o'clock to worship with us again. And if we can serve you otherwise, let us know. Visiting, please come back again. <clears throat> let me mention this before I start. Um, next Sunday night, we'll probably do a lads wrap-up for those that went to the convention or uh, family members, interested parties, to see what the program's all about. So that'll be next Sunday night. Just wanted to post you on that. <clears throat> Standing on the promises of Christ my King, study a portion of thy word and hear a message from thy holy word. We pray that you'll be with us as we depart from this place, as we take a little nourishment, a little rest, and bring us back at five o'clock for another lesson. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.